Okay. Uh, so today is going to talk about arrays, but prior to that, interestingly enough, had the exact same issue with some folks yesterday. So this is apropos to talk about. Uh, you, if you're unable to do anything on Jaguar because of disk quota exceeded, and I talked a little bit about it in class. So first, let me let me log in and identify which class so that you can go back and watch that screencast. But then I'll I'll, I'll kind of give you a short version of it uh, here as well. But unfortunately, I didn't use the term disk quota in the daily diatribe, so it may not be immediately obvious. Uh, which class it was. I want to say it was Monday or Wednesday of the week before spring break. Can you talk about the election? Yeah. Yeah. But I'll, I'll talk about it here as well because I know that, that uh, there's some folks who are having that issue right now, and obviously it isn't practical to re-watch re -watch a screencast while I'm talking. Um, right here, uh, week 8, Monday, March 10th, determining how much space your account is using. Remove. So the whole first part of this screencast should be talking about the subject in some detail. I'll give you the short version right now. If you log into Jaguar, what you need to do is you need to find things that you can delete and a good strategy is to find identify those items that are taking up the most space in your account and the command you want to use is du which stands for disk usage and that gives you usage of how much space your current directory is using plus all of the directories underneath it so if i log in and just type du it's going to basically give it for my entire uh, directory hierarchy underneath my home directory, which is what I want. It does give it to you in disk blocks, which is different depending on the file system. So the absolute number is not terribly useful to you. Uh, there are, if you listen, look at the screencast, there are ways to get this in human readable numbers. Uh, but that's, I should say, human meaningful numbers, like in terms of megabytes. Uh, However, that said that these numbers are not absolutely useful. They are useful relatively speaking, meaning that uh, this disk utils directory is not taking up a whole lot of space, whereas this site packages directory is taking up a tremendous amount of space, relatively speaking. So, And that's what we're mostly concerned with. Uh, the problem is that it's not in any particular order, so what I want to do is I want to pipe the output of this command to be the input of a command called sort, which, of course, sorts. Sort does not, by default, sort numerically. So if I add the dash n option, it's going to sort numerically. The effect is now that I get the biggest space hogs first. And so I'm probably interested in the first dozen or so of these listed here. And you can tell in my case, it's this .kde directory that's gobbling up most of the space. So if I remove that directory and everything underneath it, that's going to free up the most room. Uh, <clears throat> probably, my guess is for most of you that are having disk quota issues, it's probably going to be the uh, Mozilla directory. And that's the directory that Firefox uses. And what's happening is it's caching various websites or web pages that you're browsing such as keeping copies of the images so that the next time you visit it it doesn't have to re-download all that information and can quickly pull it up from cache and the net effect is that your web browsing experience is a lot quicker it's not stuff that's really that you need very much so you can take a sledgehammer and just delete that entire directory without harm uh, all that would happen is that any browsing history and so forth would be lost uh, so, yes? It is a directory, right. So if I say 
uh, it's going to say that, which is an error. So what you want to do is you want to add the dash R option, which is recursively removing. And what that means is it will go in and remove all of the contents of the directory. And if there are any subdirectories under that, it'll go into each of those subdirectories and remove everything in there and then keep going down the entire chain until you basically have this empty skeleton of subdirectories under Mozilla. Then it starts removing the directories once everything is empty and it removes everything all the way up to and including dot Mozilla. Okay, so R and minus R is gonna do the trick. Uh, so doing something like that's not recommended with star being the wild card. That'll basically destroy your entire file hierarchy, including all your assignments, directories, and so forth. So don't do that. Um, let's see what we have here. Uh, and, and you can actually just list this directory as the du command presents it. So if I just wanted to say delete this data directory and everything under data, for instance, this is underneath data, then I could just uh, copy and paste that, do an rm minus r. Boy, that is, what is going on here? That's weird. Uh, so I could do something like that just to remove that that directory and it'll leave all this stuff alone. Okay. Uh, so with that, that should give you some disk space back and you should be back in business. All right. Any other questions before I get going? Okay. So what we're going to talk about are arrays and... that. I have to come back here. And we'll call this arrays. Okay. So we normally uh, create a variable by saying int a, and then we can either assign something to a, or we could get that information from the user. The issue comes when I have a class of 20 students And I'm left with doing something like B, C, D, E, and so forth 20 times. And then, likewise, I would be doing all this. And one of the things that we've come to find is useful when we have to do repetitive tasks in a program is to put it in a loop. And by me creating a whole bunch of individual variables like this, I do not have that flexibility. Given what I have here, there's no way for me to put these nicely in a loop. So uh, there's uh, an idea introduced in the language, and in fact, I think you'd be hard pressed to find any programming language that didn't have this, is the idea of arrays. And what you do is you simply Create, uh, give the variable a name, doesn't matter what you call it. Uh, let's say I'm keeping track of people's ages, and I say how many of them I want. <clears throat> and I'll do it like that. And what that does is that's saying, if I was to create a single age, like I, when I said int a, if I was to draw a picture of it, I would say that is the integer that I created, and then if I assign 25 to it, I would do that, right? So that's the kind of thing I've been doing up till now. If I do it like this, and I 
say that I have five ages, then the way I'd represent that pictorially is I would say this whole thing is called age. Now one of the funky things about this language and a lot of C-based languages, uh, by C-based languages I mean there's a whole family of languages out there that borrow from the syntactic conventions of the C language such as parentheses for calling functions and things like that. There are a set of languages that are nothing like this but there are a Fortunately for us, uh, a whole family of languages where if you know C or C++, it's relatively easy to jump from language to language because they share syntactic similarities. Anyway, in C-based languages, these uh, there's an interesting quirk in how you access a single age. So if I wanted to access this first age right here and assign something to it, then the way I would do that is I would say age sub zero equals 25. So counting starts at zero. So this would be age sub zero, this would be age sub one, this is age sub two, sub three, sub four. There are five ages. And counting always starts at zero, okay? It turns out that's actually quite convenient for doing for loops. So if I wanted to use a for loop to input five ages, I would say for, I'd create some sort of index. I guess I could call it IDX. Starts at zero, IDX is less than, how many do I have? Five, so I just put the five there plus plus idx, and then I can say cn age sub idx. And in fact, why don't I put some curly braces here, and let me actually put a little message. Oops, I have those chevrons backward. Question? Yes? Is there any particular reason why you would want to use the plus plus uh, instead of preceding it instead of in prefix instead of postfix? Yeah. yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, Does it determine the order that it goes in? At the, at the end of the day, it isn't going to matter. Okay. Uh, and it, it gets it. it uh, I want to see. There comes a point in your career in learning C where you actually learn how to create your own operators. You can actually create your own addition operator. So uh, the web counter, you could actually create an addition operator for the web counter class. So I could say web counter. Uh, WC, and then you could create an assignment operator. So I could actually do something like that, and that would have functionality similar to the set function. And I could say WC equals WC plus 95, and that would make WC have a value of 100. So I could act, I, the language actually has facilities for me to write this operator. There are two separate, I would have to write two separate operators for this versus this and it, once you I'm providing you a whole bunch of information where I'm going to ultimately finesse it. Uh, when you write these two you would you would have an understanding saying this one is a little bit more efficient and so that is why I'm doing this but again at the end of the day the optimizer tends to find that it, there isn't going to be a difference between either one of these and the optimi optimizer will optimize this one to be just as fast as this one. Okay, So I'm finessing a little bit in that I'm not showing you all the code, but showing you the difference between the two and why this one is more efficient. It ends up, what you find is you find two camps of people, those who put the plus plus before and those who put the plus plus after. And for whatever quirk, uh, the definitive book in learning the C language, which would have uh, originally come out in the 80s, uh, always did the for loops like this. So you find that the older generations tend to do it like this, and the newer generations who learn the proper way do it like this. Now, I was definitely brought up doing it like this, and I actually have to consciously think about it to put it before. So most of the time, if I'm doing this, then that just means I'm not thinking about it, and I'm doing what I, how I grew up with it. Uh, see out. Enter the 
And then I'll say IDX plus one. Okay, yeah. Um, let's see. There we go. Is that going to work? All right. CN. So I had that right the first time. All right. So I'd confused myself. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of all this stuff since I was side conversation. I create five ages. I'm going to comment that out. That's usage, general usage is like that. And here's where the utility comes is now I can use a variable to specify the index. And this will say enter. Actually, I'm going to, uh, I'll leave it like that. So the, this verbiage is a little bit awkward, but that's all right. So let me, uh, let me compile it. And let me run it. Enter the one age. So again, the, the verbiage is a little awkward. So 223, 45, 78, 11, 22. Okay. So that, that looks like it works fine. And then I can actually create a loop to display what I entered. So I will just copy and paste this for loop. And I will say, see out, you entered. age sub IDX for age number IDX plus one. And I'll put it on two lines so it's a little more readable with my big font here. Let's run it and then take another look at the code, make sure we understand it. Twenty-three, thirty-four, forty-five, fifty-six, sixty-seven. Oops, I probably want if I want this to be more human non-programmer friendly, I should probably add one to those. So I would say IDX plus one. Note that I don't put the plus one here, right? Because our indexing does go from zero to four. I'm just adding one on the bit where I'm saying the number entered. Enter age number one, 12, 23, 34, 45, 56. There we go. <coughs> Any questions? How would you do that? Like, not, you know, saying one, two, three, four. Could you do first, second, third? Ah, uh, yes, I could. I could do first, second, third. So. You could write a fairly complex algorithm that would be efficient to do it because note that first, 21st, 31st, right? You would uh, you'd have to find what the ending number is. So let me see. How, are, how does it go? S, T, N, D, R, D, and the rest are THs, right? So I could do a modulus. Oh, heck, you're going to make me do it, aren't you? The way you're looking at me. All right. Uh, so for I'll do this quickly. Uh, I'm going to call this func. No, I'm going to call this uh, print ordinal. And I get the integer num. And this is going to be a void function. So I'm just going to actually print it out. 
and I'm going to switch on num% 10. And I'm going to say case 1 is C out ST break. Case 2, C out ND. Case 3, C out RD. Oops, I need breaks. Case four, all the rest of them are TH, right? So I'll just say the default is to see out <coughs> What do you think? Think that'll work? Uh, I can test it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my main here and I'm going to comment the whole thing out. <coughs> Because being a good programmer, I always test stuff. And a good way of testing it is say int main. And let's choose numbers from uh, 1 to 30. So I would say for int i equals 1, i is less than or equal to 30, plus plus i. And I will I will. Uh, C out I and then I will call I need to put curly braces around this loop because I have more than one line there. And then I'm going to call this function which I, what was it? Print ordinal, get ordinal, print ordinal print ordinal ordinal and I'm going to pass an I, and then I'm going to see out end line. All right, and I'm going to test this and see if it works. G++ code. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh. Ooh, look at that. That didn't work. I got a bug. Eleventh, twelfthand. 13th, 14th, 15th, 20th, 21st, 22nd, 23rd. So it, where I get screwed up in the teens, right? So it's 11th, 12th, 13th, yes? Well, we can fix that. So we just create cases for those. Case 11 is going to be the same, is going to be the same as the default. Oh, so it's 11th. Um, let me see. It's going to be, oh, I, ooh, yeah. Hmm. Okay. Uh, let's see. What's the quick hack? So you, what you do is you just hack this stuff. So you come up here before you do it, and you say, um, if num is equal to 11 or num is equal to 12 or num is equal to 13 then I'm going to see out th and I'll return and again I need to put this there so that'll catch my exception. I don't know if this is the most graceful way of doing it, but if I'm hacking and throwing this together quickly like I am, threatening me successfully finishing this lecture on time. Okay. Here, let's see what we got. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth, eighteenth, nineteenth, twentieth, twenty-first, twenty-second, twenty-third, twenty-fourth, and on we go. All right. Thanks. I'll be passing a hat around later. Okay. Hmm. That might make a good homework problem for the next semester. I have to think about that. So I will. Uh, I'll just comment out this main. I don't need to comment out the function. I'm just not going to use the function. Yeah. I have like 113. Uh. Just do the same thing you do with the uh, 
That only looks at the last. So here I have to say uh, num percent 100. Yeah? Does that work? Does that solve that problem? 111th, 112th, 113th, 1011th. Yeah, it should work. <coughs> All right. Don't throw it. What if it's an imaginary number or anything like that at me? Okay. <laughs> All right. So you see that the modulus operator is actually pretty cool in a lot of different circumstances. Yeah. It's a good. It's a good. Uh, good operator to have up your sleeve to pull out victoriously while you're. Co-workers are scratching their heads over something. Yeah. Are there rules in terms of where you can use arrays? Uh, yeah. So let me let me continue the discussion on where I left off. Okay. So does everyone get the general idea behind arrays? Not too difficult. It's like having five variables with the same name. You just have to have the subscript here. Okay. There are some interesting quirks, and the first quirk is that there is nothing in the language that enforces the number that you put in square braces here. So you know and I know that I made a copy of this code so I'm just going to delete it. All right, you know and I know that I only have room for five integers here, as shown right here. But there's nothing in the language that's going to keep me from continuing to make this go. What's going to happen if, after this gets past the fifth one, after it gets past index four? So this is my CN statements. So what it'll do is it'll put, let's say I enter uh, 12, 23, 34, 45, 56, 67, 78. Right? What it does is it just keeps marching, putting the numbers further and further out. Even though I did not allocate space for them, the language is going to blindly put them wherever I tell it to put. And what is the result of doing that? Let's see if we can find out. Doesn't seem to be causing any troubles. Yeah, what, finally, did I get something here? Oh, darn, it looks like I accidentally hit Control-C. Uh, well, let's write a program to do this so I don't have to do it. Let's just say, let me comment this out, and uh, let me just say that uh, age sub IDX, and it doesn't matter, I'll just assign some number to it, and we'll make this go up to like that. Okay, I'll comment, I've already commented that out, there we go. So let's see what happens. I compile it, I run it. All right, it got up to 221, and then I got this segmentation fault. <clears throat> and a segmentation fault is a fancy term for you're marching over someone else's memory, and you're not allowed to march over that memory. Okay, and so what's happening is the operating system is shutting you down. So this ends up being where you as fluent programmers spend a tremendous amount of your debugging time is dealing with this kind of stuff. So right now there's been a fair amount of struggling and just getting your darn program to compile. Once you're fluent in the language, compiling's the easiest thing in the world. Anyone can get a program to compile. You just have to know where to put the semicolon, right? This takes forever to figure out because you've got 10,000 lines of code and it seems to be running just fine and all of a sudden out of the blue you get this. 
and it isn't always where you think it is because what I could do, let's say that I just did 218 of these, so I didn't get the segmentation fault, but then about 50 lines of code later, you try to use that memory, and that memory is corrupted because I wrote 99 to it, and now it all throws up at that point. So you're looking 50 lines down when the problem really is in that loop up there. So this is, this is, this is where mature programmers spend all their time, figuring out why the hell their programs are bombing out. And it's always because, well, it's almost always because of memory issues like this. All right. Um, so what happens if I'm gonna let me make this all correct again? All right. So there's my original program. So here, I'm printing out this array, but I, I don't have any subscript here. So what happens if you just print out, you just provide the name of the array? Let's watch what happens when I do that. Okay, so here, so this is all the previous code, and then here's the line I added. The entire array is... So when I print, put age there without the subscript, I get this real funky looking number. And what this number is, is uh, incidentally in the language, if something's <laughs> preceded by a 0x, that means it's in hexadecimal. So this is just a, a number, an integer, but it's, a, it's put in hexadecimal form. And what this number actually is, is that number is actually this number right here. That's the number that's printing out. So if I, if I say age sub 0, it's going to give me the 12. If I say age sub 3, it's going to give me the 45. However, if I say age by itself, it doesn't know which of these five I, I want to use. So all it provides is the address where the whole thing begins. Okay. You can create arrays of anything. So if I wanted to, I could say I want to create 99 web counter objects. That'll work. And if I want to call a function um, like the reset function, I could say wc sub 32 reset. That's what that syntax looks like. So the 33rd wc, I'm calling the reset function on it. Uh, of course, you could do it with knight or weapon as well, All right? Something like that. There's what uh, all the built-in types, of course, work. There's one type though that is very, very odd, and that is the character type. If I create an array of characters, then the language behaves a little bit differently. So to, to talk about why, first recall that if we want to use strings in C++, we have to include string. And then we do something like string s, and then we can do things with s. Okay. What the reason you're including, so the reason we are learning now why we keep header files is those header files, when we're dealing with classes, serve as where we put the blueprint for a class, right? So the in webcounter.h, we put the blueprint or the class declaration for webcounter describing how it is we use a webcounter. It's exactly the same for this. So that someone actually wrote a class called string, and that's the blueprint for it in this file. If you were to find the file and look at it, somewhere in there you'd see class string and then an open curly brace and a bunch of stuff and a closed curly brace. Okay. So the string is not intrinsically built into the language. It is something that someone wrote. 
that is contrasted with something like int or float. Those are intrinsic to the language and are built into the language. So that's the, the differentiator that I want you to, to note. The reason it, this is being written is that the C language has no built-in string type. And the way that you represent strings in the C language is with an array of characters. And so now, uh, what I'm going to do is, I think I'll copy this. I'll call this strings.cpp. And I will create Yes. Huh? Other way. Oh, darn it. <coughs> so I would do this if I know that or suspect that people are going to give me names of 100 characters or less. Uh, that's how much space is set aside. So if I come to this. This is name. Actually, I'm going to change it to uh, so this all fits. I'm going to call it just 20. Yeah, even look. Let's make it uh, 15. All right. So it would set set aside, and it would call this name. So if I want to input my name, yeah, I guess I can say C out. Your name is name. Oops. What's your name? Todd. Your name is Todd. Okay. So what's happening is that here in the CN statement, What is going on here? Is it put the T, the O, the D, and the D? But we have a, a bit of an unknown here, which is how does this thing know where to stop? Right, because there, there are a couple issues. One is that I set aside 15 spaces. Uh, so what it actually is here? Is it, what, when I first create it, so if I go to look at line 6, what is inside these 15 bytes? Whatever was there before. Whatever was there before. Just total garbage, right? So I could have had Mickey Mouse in there before, in which case it would be M-I-C-K-E-Y. No? Okay. Sorry, it's, it's, it's been a long morning. Uh, mouse, O-U-S-E. If you sang it, it probably come back to you. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, if Mickey Mouse was in there before and I allocate it and I type in Todd, how's that thing know to stop at the D and Todd on line 10 and not print Toddy, Toddy Mouse? Right? And so the programming languages deal with this issue in one of two ways. The first way is somewhere they hide an extra integer. So what they might do typically is here they would put an extra integer and what they would do is they would put the length of that string. So when I type in Todd on line 9, what it would do is put in T-O-D-D, -D, and then it would know to put a 4 right here. And so it would, when I print it out, it would stop at the fourth character. 
That's not how C, C++ do it. The way they do it is they, when the string is done, they then set the following byte to zero, meaning that all eight bits are zero. And what it'll do is it'll say, is this zero? No, print it out. Is this zero? No, print it out. Is this zero? No, da, da, da. And as soon as it finds uh, a byte that's zero, then it stops printing out. So this is what are, is referred to as null terminated strings. Uh, this is, so a zero byte is considered a null, a null character. Now, the, so just as there's a way of representing the letter A, you do it with single quotes, you can represent the null character with single quotes as well. What that is, is that's a backslash zero. Kind of in the same sense that backslash N is a new line and backslash T, it, whoops, now I'm just getting way out there. Uh, backslash T is a tab and so forth. The backslash zero means the null byte. And you can actually play with that a little bit. Um, what I can do is I can take name sub 2 and set that to the null byte. Whoops. And looking at my picture here, this is 0, this is 1, this is 2. So what I'm doing is I'm changing that to the null byte, right? So if I print out the string again, what should print out? T O. It's print the T, the O, then it sees a 0 and it stops. Now note that one thing to note is this is far different than this. This is the character 0. This is the null byte. Okay, So this has all zeros in the byte. This has some, uh, some of these are flipped to ones. All right, so we can watch that in action. I'll, I'll copy and paste the, the your name is here. So we see, uh, what we see is the final quirk in the language, and that is right here. So what happened when we printed out age by itself without any subscripts? It only printed out the address of the beginning of age. It's that way for every single array, whether it's web counter, night, float, int, everything except an array of characters. If it's an array of characters, it will assume that it's a string and it'll start printing out characters until it finds a null byte. Okay, and all this is for historical reasons in that the C language has nothing called a string, so they represent strings as an array of characters. Any questions? Can you yes. use an array to um, let's see, let's, uh, put them, say, in a class and then different functions? You can assign different names or values to that? So let's say you have yeah, so you, if the question is, can you have an array of something in a class? Absolutely. You right. can. I was wondering, like, if you say you have, uh, you've allocated 10, an array that's got 10 spaces, uh -huh. can different functions use that space? Calling it different things, naming it different things, like what you know, does that make any sense? Yes. So if you if you set aside space for ten floating point numbers, can you refer to that space by different terms? Yeah. Uh, the answer is yes, but I haven't discussed how. And the key is right here is um, this number right here. If you have this number, then I have access to this entire array, right? And all I have to do is pass this number around. And that's uh, what's going to be next in our journey in the language, which is called pointers. And meaning the, a pointer is basically one of these addresses here. And I can pass that pointer around wherever I want and then be able to access this array because I have the beginning of it. Okay, so hopefully that should be enough for you to knock out the homework. One important thing to note about the homework, it says, uh, I think I have it up so I can, let me show you in 20 seconds a uh, gotcha that will save you some time and keep you from doing it wrong. 
So you have to create array. Here are the tasks you have to do. Print the numbers having odd indices. Print the numbers having even indices. This is the key that everyone misses. An, an, indice, an index, the indices are these things. Let's, this right here, this is the index, right? So when I say the odd indices, that would mean age sub 1, age sub 3, age sub 5. It does not mean the odd ages, and it doesn't mean the even ages. It means these indexes here are odd or even. Okay, So keep that in mind when you do the homework. You're not concerned about what's in this variable. You're concerned about what's in that variable. What does that mean? What does what mean? I don't know. About asking you to do this, you mean? Yeah. Uh, what, what does that mean? So in my so this is you're filling an array with ten numbers. You need to do it in reverse index order. You have to print the numbers having odd indices, those having even indices. So if I was to do it for what I've done here, I would get five ages from the user. Printing the odd indices would be to print age sub one, age sub three, and then printing the even indices would be print age sub zero, age sub two, and age sub four. So that's what that means. All right. Uh, but you also said that um, we need to, to uh, be passing the index and the uh, argument well, for the assignment. Uh, here? Yeah, at the bottom. Is that easy to function? Take a float array while well, yeah. passing. Um, yeah, so you, there, are, uh, uh, there are a few ways to do it. You should be, I should be able to write a function that's func void and I can say int age sub 5 and I should be able to call that function like that. Uh, oops. So is that, uh, is that calling, or is that using the entire Yeah, I believe, uh, you know, I, I think what's going to, see, the problem is it's getting into stuff we haven't talked about. So you could do this as a recipe and it'll work. Really, uh, what this is the equivalent of is an age pointer. This really is just uh, holding, this ends up being, we know that writing it by itself is the address, yeah. is this number right here. Yeah. So when I write it like this, that 100 comes up here and is stored in this variable. And it just ends up working seamlessly. So let me even rename it. Let me call this um, Bob. If I say Bob sub 3, it's going to be accessing, based on this number here, 3 in. The third, or the fourth one in, I guess it would be. So I'm, this, this gets into a lot about the next topic of discussion, which is the pointers and addresses. And that's where all that comes together. Right. You can basically use what I'm showing here as a recipe. So, just uh, if you create if you create an array, just actually declare it exactly the same way as an argument to the function, and then you can use it the way you expect to use it, and it'll work fine. I believe what's happening here is this number is just getting ignored, and this is just enough room to hold that 100. Yeah, what, what I had done was actually, I just, um, I just declared the, uh, the array as a constant outside of the... Uh, the oh, so that, so that you could access, access it from within. Yeah, yeah, you should be able to pass it like that. So, okay. <coughs> um, another quick question about the, the bin, copy and paste. Uh, uh-huh. You can yeah. copy and paste the... Just the line signal. I don't want to highlight it, and I know how to yank just the part that I highlighted. But then, how do you put it exactly where you want it to go? So it puts it down below. I want to put it like right underneath the cursor in that same line. Uh, so it depends on whether you yanked an entire line or not. So if I high, if I do an uppercase, or what are you doing? You're doing something like this. 
You said you know how to highlight it. You're highlighting it like that? Uh, right, let's see, with the V. Are you doing a what, a shift V? That was Control the the short answer is control V is what you want and not shift V. Shift V is gonna highlight entire lines. Right, right, okay. Yeah, so control V, yeah, highlight So if I for instance do this, I do I'm on the R, I do control V and I get actually let me start with some. So there's I start on the R, I do a control V and I go to about this much of it. Yeah. And I do Y for yank. Now if I come up here and I do P for put it'll actually put it right there. I was doing YY. Okay. Right, and what YY is going to do, since it's grabbing the entire line, it can't stick the entire line midway, so it'll end up putting it below. Okay. Now you can make it work, it just ends up being a bit of a hack. You go YY, I come up here, insert, return, escape, up, put, now I join it all back together. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Except for some reason in SigWin, like backspace and delete, when I'm in insert mode, don't work the same. Oh, really? So it's kind of, yeah, I have to, uh, I have to get around it. So. There should be, look at, look, um, SigWin. You know, I'd, I'd Google that. I would say backspace delete, don't work in Vim, SigWin, something like that. Put yeah. that in Google, and I bet you someone will say, well, just put this in your Vim RC or do XYZ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So, so that's definitely a fixable problem. When I was, um, for some reason, my, my function when I'm inputting, um, when, I'm, when I'm asking the user for input to fill the numbers, if you put a, a letter in there instead of a number, it'll create an infinite loop. Right. And uh, I wondered if there was some sort of something either input validation or there is, uh, and um, if, well, I can I can direct you to something right now. So if you go to the what is it? Uh, if you go to the YouTube CSCI one fourteen channel, and that isn't it. Hang on. Uh, let me try that again. So if I, where is my, my channel? All right, so you go to this channel where I have all the videos, and let me find it here. I think I have it here. I don't have it there, where did I put it? Uh, give me just a moment. Now I need to I need to check my email so I don't remember where I put it. Uh, I did a, a substitute the other 111 lecturer uh, had to be absent a couple weeks ago, and so I covered his class form, and that question came up. So I did a little song and dance, and I did a video of it, so let me find where the video is. So here's the video, and where is this? Oh, I made, um, I think I must have made it invisible. So if I click here, I go to Video Manager, what I'll do is I'll make it visible. And then it'll show up on your channel. CSCI one. Yeah, that's where it is. I just have it invisible. So what I'll do is I'll, from unlisted, I'll make it public. Publish. All right, so if I go back to the channel, 
then you should see, just uh, do a search for David. And it's on there. Hang on, it's got to be here somewhere. that again. Maybe I didn't get it set quite right. Edit. Public. Are you seeing it? Are you at the channel? Yeah. Do you see it there? Uh, any video that starts with the word David's? David? Yeah, I can do that. All right, so I'll do that. So let me go to back here. Uh, All right, so that link should be hitting your inbox. Okay, yeah, appreciate it. Mm -hmm. 